in Luke chapter number 8. Now we're going to continue. We started in uh, Sunday school the other day and talking about uh, the importance of the Bible. I'm giving you some verses to mark down. Now, your belief in the Bible is important. It's huge. Just hearing the Bible doesn't do you any good. It's learning to believe the Bible. So I felt like this. And you realize this. Most people are not necessarily opposed to the Bible uh, on purpose. Most people just don't know. Be careful when you're dealing with somebody when it comes to this issue about the Bible and even about certain doctrines in the Bible. Most of them are not willingly ignorant. They are just ignorant. Nobody has ever taught them. They don't know anything. Uh, be kind and be gracious with them. Always err on the side of uh, nobody ever showed them. Remember where you were before somebody showed you. And, and, and give them as much room as God gave you. And now all of a sudden you've got this bright light that's shining brighter than the sun. Don't let it go to your head and think that you're something special. Be gracious and be generous with people as much as God was with you when He showed you certain Amen. things. Amen. And now that you're starting to see certain things, then be, be gentle. It's like uh, uh, my wife's been feeding these little baby ducks that are coming to the back thing and and, you know, all of a sudden she's like, well, they can't do the sunflower seed. It's too much for them. So i got to get them regular seed because they like, mama duck likes the regular, the, the sunflower. But the baby ducks, they like the little seed. And, and, and so we got to go buy the little seed for the baby ducks. And, but now there's a, aww. And they are cute, man. I mean, they jump all in the bowl and everything like that. I and mean, we're like two little kids watching them. It, I like it. It's, it's a blessing to see them little ducks. There's. The other day I was doing some stuff out there and trying to get some mess cleaned up and Drina comes out and I keep hearing this voice, turn around, turn around. And I'm like, all this time I thought the Lord was a male and he sounded like a female. You know? I'm like, turn around. And then I realized it was Drina and I turn around and here goes a mama duck and ten little ones right behind him. You know, just, I thought that was cool. But, but here's the thing, you want to remember that when you start showing people some of this stuff, they're like those little chicks. They're like those little baby ducks. You've you got to give them a little bit. Right, you can't cut off a piece of steak and say, here, have at it. You know, here's a knife and a fork. Make, make way for yourself or take a bite. <laughs> be, be gentle with them. All right, look at this thing in Luke. This is just a parable here, and then we'll get back to this other deal. Luke chapter number 8. Uh, and the Bible says this. This has to do with uh, verse 5. I said, first of all, verse number 5. Uh, the sower went out to sow his seed, and when he sowed, some fell by the wayside. And it was trodden down, the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. Other fell on the good ground and sprang up and bare fruit a hundredfold, and so on and so forth. Come down now to verse number 11. The seed is the Word of God. So that's the Bible for you and I. Those by the wayside are they that hear. But then cometh the devil... And taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. So one of the things you want to realize is, is that if the devil can undermine the book, then he can undermine your faith in the book, and he can undermine your faith ultimately in Jesus Christ. All right, I left you with Acts chapter number 8. We'll go uh, now to Colossians chapter number 1. Colossians chapter number 1. Now, these are verses that they mess with in your Bible. Now, there's more uh, verses than you can possibly imagine, more than Carter's got pills, of verses they've taken out of the Bible, completely out. And if you study those verses, and I'll give them to you eventually, but if you study those verses, you'll find out there's no way that anybody but the devil would be behind doing that. Amen. So just as much as God uses human instrument, the devil uses human instrument. Uh, people are enamored with education nowadays. They think because somebody has a big degree, they think that automatically that makes them an expert. Not necessarily so. Amen. <laughs> they may be an expert, but then you've got to be able to, you have just as much right when it comes to the Bible to see what the Bible says. And if an expert tells you something contrary to the Bible, then they're wrong. I don't care how many degrees Amen. they have. Amen. I don't care if they can speak all the languages and they know all the ways that it's divided. All right, here's Colossians chapter number 1. You tell me who would be the author of this. Colossians chapter number 1, look if you will please, in verse number 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. The words through his blood are taken out. Well, who would take that out? Why would he take the blood out? How come it is that in the Bible they do mess with a couple of things? They mess with the virgin birth. I'll show you that in a minute. 
I'll show you that they refer to, I already showed you a couple of them on Sunday, but I'll show you where they refer to Joseph as being the father of Jesus. That makes him human. I'll tell you this also about the Lord. They'll say when the time of the purification came, and it says when they came to offer sacrifice, you just made Jesus a sinner. You know what your King James Bible says? Mary came to offer sacrifice. Right. You know why it's written that way? To let you know Jesus didn't need to offer no sacrifice. You say, why? He wasn't a sinner. Amen. If he's a sinner, he can't die for you. So, well, but what they're just trying to say is, is that they were all coming together. No, they're not. No, they're not. What they're trying to say is, is Jesus was just a man. You take the blood out, you've got a real problem. Leave your finger there. Come back up just to Acts chapter number 20. Acts chapter number 20. How was I bought? You were bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Redemption through his blood. You, Hebrews tells you that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Everything points to blood. And the Old Testament was done by sacrifices. But you ever look at this? People say, I just don't believe in a bloody book. I don't believe in a bloody book. Okay, well, well hold on just a second. Let's just see about that. Uh, most of you got on leather shoes. <coughs> Somebody died so to provide something for you. Or you got on a leather belt. That's right. A lot of us, it looks like a fence around a chicken graveyard. <laughs> in bad need of repair. <laughs> I heard this preacher recently. He got up to preach, man. He was shucking the corn and peeling the taters, man. I mean, he was laying it out there. and He was telling everybody, you need to quit this and stop this and don't do this and don't do that and so on and so forth. He weighed 350 pounds if he weighed an ounce. <laughs> And I thought, this must be a joke to these people. <laughs> now, I, I, I understand not everybody gets control over everything, but you're talking about living a life with moderation in it and talking about don't watch television and don't do this and don't dress that and so on and so forth. And then the guy goes out there and sits down and eats half an apple pie with a quart of ice cream at 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> yeah, that must be the supper of champions, I guess. <laughs> But I'm thinking, that must be a joke to people out there. You're, come on, preacher, you're telling me about that and you can't control your mouth? Right. Amen. You'd be surprised how much in controlling your character is connected with controlling what you eat. Mm -hmm. Amen. We'll get That's off good. of that. Amen. You say, what's the Lord's opinion of it? The Lord's opinion of it, if you can't control it, cut your throat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm not saying to do that. I'm just saying that's what he says to do. Uh, I've just made a bunch of enemies. Acts chapter number 20, verse 28. I know that's all we got left. You know, it's like, well, preacher, oh, good night. All we can do is just, you know, sleep and eat and fight. You don't even let us fight or don't enjoy fighting anymore. So now we can just sleep and eat. So, you know, I know. And then you have to be moderate with that. My wife getting up at 4.30 in the morning. I'm like, honey, just oh, good night. See you. I'm still, I'm still halfway through the night of sleep. And she's up at 4.30. She rises up early, you know, and she's in there and all this. By the time I get up, man, she's got half a day done. Acts chapter number 20, verse 28. There's a lesson in there somewhere, I guess. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you oversee is to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased. Huh. You think there's something to the blood? Well, he said you have redemption through his blood. Come back, if you will, please, to the book of Colossians. A lot of things you get through the blood, you don't get any other way. You're reconciled to, to him through his blood. And you have a, a, a redemption because of his blood through him. Now, how come they would take that out? Because they don't want you getting the blood. Look in Colossians chapter 1 at the same passage. Look, if you will, please, in verse number 2. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossal, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, well, what's the big deal there? How come they took out the Lord Jesus Christ? Why would they do that? What's it hurt in the verse? He's telling you who purchased you. He's telling you who bought you. Come to chapter number 2. Chapter number 2, look in verse 11. These are things that are out of your versions. Verse number 11, 211. In whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and the putting off of the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Jesus Christ. You know what they take off? Of the sins of. So let's take that out all together, okay? The circumcision made without him and the putting off of the body by the circumcision of Christ. Well, why don't why'd you take sins out? Because your sins are committed by your flesh. He cut them away. 
That passage right there is your verse on eternal security, ladies and gentlemen. It shows your flesh is separated from your soul. So, well, preacher, it's no big deal. It's just easy to understand. I'm tired of you people being lied to, and I'm tired of you falling Amen. for this Amen. idea Amen. that it's about these and thou's. Amen. You don't have any problem reading these and thou's. That's not the stuff they're taking out. The these and the, we just took out the these and the owls, thou's to bring it up to modern, up to date language. You know, what? It, hey, wait a minute. I'm reading the king's language. These and thou's, it's royalty. But that's not what they're taking out. I haven't showed you one place where they took out a thee or a thou. They're lying to you. Oh, well, we want to get it. What makes you think up the date's better? I think a lot of things that were made a long time ago were better. Gen, or, uh, Colossians chapter number 3. Colossians chapter 3. Look in verse number, oh, let's see, it'll be 6. 3, 6. For which things say the wrath cometh upon, cometh on. No, it's not in there. The, Bible, the, the, the new Bibles say this, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh. They take out on the children of disobedience. Well, the, that means the wrath of God can fall on you. I don't get the wrath of God. The Bible teaches me I'm clear from the wrath of God. I don't get the wrath of God. I don't get the wrath of the Lamb, and I don't get the wrath of Satan. But that teaches that you can still do it. That must be written by somebody that doesn't believe in eternal security. I've been delivered from the wrath of God. So, well, nobody's delivered from it. You are. You're delivered from it if you believe what the Bible says. Look in 1 Peter chapter number 4. 1 Peter 4. No, stop in, uh, oh, what is the passage? 1 Timothy 3. 1 Timothy 3. I got a lot of these. I'm just trying to show you the main ones. And you can mark them in your Bible if you want to. And if you don't, you know, it's like, well, preacher, I don't need to know this. A lot of times you'll deal with individuals and they'll come up there and they'll have their Bible. And what you can do if you use your your ability here, you just go to a couple of verses and you read this verse like I'm fixing to read to you right now, like you, everybody would have it in their Bible, right? And so you just read the verse and then you'll see them go. And the, the question mark comes up. A lot of times it happens in a church service here and they'll come up and they'll say, well, preacher, you read such and such a verse. That wasn't in my Bible. I said, okay, do you have a Bible? And I said, well, yeah, I, I've got this Bible right here. I said, okay, look up this verse that I'm fixing to show you now and look up this verse over here and look up this verse and they'll go, well, that's not in my Bible. Okay, well, do you want something that's not there? Why would you do that? Why would they do that? Wouldn't you want something that's got everything in it? Amen. They're like, well, I never knew. They don't know. They think all Bibles are the same. If it says New King James, they say, oh, well, it's new, so it must be better. Every Bible that's ever written, there's 380-something of them now that's out on the market. Every single one of them was an up-to-date version, not of the version before, but of a King James Bible. Better than the old original. Well, what's the problem? They're trying to get the king off the throne. Look, if you will, in 1 Timothy chapter number 3. 1 Timothy chapter number 3, look in verse number 16. I think it's a key verse here, but we'll see what happens. Without controversy... Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified by the Spirit, seen of angels. Do you think that's important? Yes, sir. Amen. Well, I think it's pretty important. They take God out. Look, and leave your finger there if you want to, just a minute, and come to 1 John chapter number 4. 1 John chapter 4. You say, God manifest in the flesh. You know what that is? That's a mystery that's revealed, but that has to do with the deity of Christ. Why would they take that out? Why would they tell you that in original Greek that term is not there? It must have been in some original Greek. It's in your King James Bible. They never say that. They act like there was only one Greek manuscript. They don't tell you that the manuscript they're getting has to do with Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, which are Catholic manuscripts. And they don't tell you that that's not the only manuscript. That's, out of, that's Latin stuff. That comes out of, out of Alexandria. Your stuff comes from Antioch. I'll show you. I've got all the stuff in my office. I'll show you the, the path the King James Bible came from. But let me ask you a question. What manuscript would, would remove God manifest in the flesh? Why would they want you to do that? That doesn't even make sense. Well, preacher, all Bibles are the same. Are you kidding me? I'm going to show you in just a second. If that's not God, we're headed for trouble. Because nobody else can pay for his creation. 
You say, preacher, is believing that God was manifest in the flesh important? I don't know. I'll see what the Bible says. 1 John 4, beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know you the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist whereof you have heard that it should come even now already is in the world. Come to 1 John chapter number 5. You know what he says? Try the spirits. There's a passage there in the New Testament and he says, uh, You can't love the Father if you don't love the Son. Put that one on a Jehovah's Witness. It says the Father doesn't love you if you don't love His boy. You say, why? It's one and the same. Amen. Chapter and verse. I'm going to show it to you. You ready? Verse 20. 1 John chapter 5, verse 20. The Bible says, And we know the Son of God has come Amen. and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true, and we are in Him that is true. Amen even in His Son, Jesus Christ. So we're talking about being in Jesus. You agree with that? Yes, this is the true God and eternal life. Amen. Who's the true God? Jesus Christ. So do you think God being manifest in the flesh is important for you? Yes. There's no other way whereby a man must be saved. Amen. Well, why would they take that out? How would you like to be the scholar to stand up in front of the Jesus Christ and say, well, now, Lord, I just wanted to say that the better Greek manuscript of that said, and I was taught in school, and my further investigation revealed, and the Lord says, uh, well, I had a manuscript down there that had me in there. I want to know why you didn't go with that and you went right. with the other. Because right. you got a different spirit, and you're saved, and you lose your part in the book of life. And it means you lose your awards. You mess with a book, you're messing with something. Amen. It's a holy Bible. Amen. I've showed you this before. You can count it out if you'd like to. Nine in the, in the Bible is a number for perfect fruit. Holy Bible. Count the letters. Nine letters. King James. Nine letters. 1611. Six plus three ones. Three times nine is... I'll give you a clue. 27. <laughs> Three times nine is 27. What's two plus seven? Now you got four nines. Brother Brad, what's four times nine? Four times nine? 36. 36. <laughs> I like how he counts the offerings. Four times nine, 30. Add six and three. That thing runs all the way out. It's a derivative of nine. You say, why? God knew what he was doing when he wrote your Bible. Amen. Say, Preacher, I think you're carrying it too far. <laughs> I think the chapter and verse markings are inspired. Amen. Well, I don't believe that. That's why I'm funny about messing with a book. So well, I'm not really messing with it. Yeah, you are. You're trying to bring it around to make it think what you, uh, say what you want it to say. You're messing with his book. The better thing to do is to say, I don't know that I understand all that stuff. I just have to leave it like it is and right. let God work it out. I'm not sure where a man gets the idea he can correct God's book. You must have something going on in your heart. Because if you can cast doubt on a verse in the Bible, you can cast doubt on anything. That's the yea hath God said society. That's Genesis 3. That's what separates you from every other place in Duval County or in the rest of the world for that matter. You believe the Bible like it's written. They sit in judgment of the Bible. Now sometimes they do it in the name of judging the preacher. But the fact is, if a preacher is preaching the Bible, you're not judging the preacher. You might judge his speech, and you might judge his mannerisms, but you're, you're judging the book Amen. Amen. if you're judging the words. Amen. Amen. All right, are you still there in Timothy? Look in 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy 2. This is a famous one. 2 Timothy chapter number 2. Now, it won't be long tonight. I'll just give you these things and kind of wet your whistle a little bit for what's coming on Sunday. 2 Timothy chapter 2. You would know this verse if you've been here any amount of time at all. What's the word there? You should be able to quote it probably by now from memory. What does it say? Study. Do what? Study. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Work me as not to be ashamed. What? How come they take the word study out? What's the benefit of a Greek manuscript that tells you that you don't need to study? 
Why do they pick on that verse? Can I tell you why? You want to know the trick of the trade? If I can keep you from studying, then I can make the Bible say anything that I believe that it says to try to to pervert you or twist you or to control you because you're not studying on your own, so you rely to me. So he takes the word... Why would you take that one one word? Why would you take that out? Be diligent. To show yourself approved unto God a workman yet. No, he says to study. You say, why? Because you don't get hoodooed that way. You study the Bible. You know the text. You know what the Bible says. You read the Bible. You rightly divide the Bible. You don't know all the Bible, but if you study the Bible, the Lord won't necessarily show you what it is, but you sure enough know what it ain't. Yeah. Amen. That's right? Amen. right? That's right. You can tell right off the bat whether somebody's got God in it or not. You can tell right off the bat whether they're whacked out. You ever hear somebody get up and they start to <coughs> preach and they don't quote King James? You can tell right off the bat. It don't That's ring right. right. There's no other Bible that has the poetic sensation and the melodious way of doing things. When they come ready to to memorize verses, it's written and broken up in a way of stanzas. So when they want to get their kids to memorize the Bible, the King James is the easiest one to memorize. The King James is written in sixth grade English. They put it in a computer. Came out sixth grade English. You say, why? You ain't got to have a whole lot of sense to read it. He says, give attendance to reading. Why would they take the word study out? Just trust me, I'll tell you the truth about it. Really, don't study for your FCAT. We'll take care of it. First uh, Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4. These are just a few things that are in there. But I think they're amazing things. You've got the blood messed with. I already showed you where they messed with his deity in Luke chapter number 2 and Luke chapter number 4. Um, I'll, I'll show you that other passage there in a minute. It's in Luke. I'll have to go back and show it to you where they make the Lord out to be a sinner. It's a little slick trick. And if you don't read your Bible, you don't even realize it. And you know what? If that's the only Bible you have, you won't even know that it's been changed. So I, what I do is I believe what the bankers do. What the bankers do, or at least they did back years ago when I was there, what the bankers did when they were trying to teach about counterfeits, they just taught them real good what the real thing was. And then when the false thing came along, they were able to pick it up. But they didn't know exactly what was going on. They just knew it wasn't a real thing. So get familiar with your Bible, and then you'll realize the Holy Spirit will go, Now, wait a minute. That don't ring right, does it? As the old woman used to say, Preacher, that don't ring right, she'd say. Yeah, it don't ring right. It don't have the right ring to it. First Peter chapter number 4, look in verse number 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. Did you miss what I picked up, what I left out? Why would they take that out? Christ hath suffered in the flesh, arm yourself. What did he suffer for? For us. Why would you take that out? You're going to tell me that if God died for you and he's going to have that taken out of the oldest and the best manuscripts and it'll be to your benefit? That's a strange thing if you ask me. 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. You say, well, you shouldn't be a, 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 a smart aleck about it. Okay, I'll try to work on my attitude if you'll stick with the book. Amen. Amen. I, I get wore out with these people because what they do is they vault their education over you. Amen. They treat you like you're ignorant. Amen. Yeah. Well, you've got country sense. That's how people get enslaved. That's how people get in trouble. Arm yourself. Put something in your noodle. (laughs) Yeah, study it. That way you can't be hoodooed when they come along. The most spiritual, the most important thing in your life is your spiritual relationship. The most thing, the most important decision you make is who are you going to allow to help you watch for your soul. You say no. The most important thing is a heart surgeon. No, you're going to die one day or not, even if they fix your heart up. Well, the most important thing is, you know, I want to go have a, 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 my, my shoulder replaced here. And Okay, good. That ain't the most important thing. You say, why? Because it's going to rot and fall off one day anyway. Well, the most important thing is, you know, what? What's more important than where you're going to spend eternity? Right. Answer, nothing. Right. You better be in the right place. You say, why? You're dealing with eternal things here. Amen. You want to know why a pastor gets upset when people try to tear up a church? Because they don't realize what they're doing. They think they're messing with something that goes on down here. You're messing with souls. 
The job of a pastor is to watch for your souls. Amen. Well, I can't watch for your soul without giving you the book. That's how I watch for you. It's not like, Brad, I see your soul in there. <laughs> it's looking pretty dark right now. <laughs> Are you doing all right? I'm watching your soul. I can't see your soul. And you can't tell. Brad's, you know, poker face. You can't tell what's going on in Brad's life right now. He might have stuff going on in his physical body that aren't affecting his soul at all. How does a preacher watch for your soul? He gives you the book. Amen. That's why the Lord is so funny about when you go to tear stuff up. He's like, you don't even realize the realm you're dealing with. When you get up and preach a gospel that doesn't have the blood of Jesus Christ Amen. and the death, burial, and resurrection, you're messing with eternal things. Amen. When you mess with the rewards at the judgment seat of Christ, you're messing with eternal things. It's not just I didn't get my way and they didn't do this and they didn't do that. It's not just the physical things. You're messing with eternal things. Amen. You're affecting people in eternity. Amen. It's a lot bigger than you think it is. It's a lot, a whole lot. It's not just, well, I don't like the music over there, and I don't like that preacher, and I don't like this. You're messing with eternal stuff. Amen. Much more important than, than financial decisions. You listen, you people are worried about who's going to give you a quarter of a percent interest on your savings account for your $25 in there or whatever that gets, you know, grows every year, you know, you get your statement at the end of the year and then your taxes ate up the 50 cents that you got on your $25. We had a card a long time ago and, you know, well, you use this card, you know, you get money back. Well, that's a hook, man. You go out there and you use the card and use the card and use the card and you spend all that money and you still got to pay the bill and at the end, here's $3 for $800 worth of bills. Keep your cotton picking $3. I'll just put it on the card or the debit from now on or pay it for cash. It ain't worth the $3 because I just paid that to keep the card. <laughs> By the time you get to the end of the year, it doesn't even pay for your renewal fee. That's the dumbest stuff. I, but you people, you worry about, you know, I've got to get the best year. I'm going to go refinance my house. I can save a whole percent of interest. And you don't pay any attention at all to what you do when you mess up things in the church. You don't realize when you don't come to church, it affects other people. You don't care. You don't care at all. You care about yourself. The reason you don't come is it has nothing to do with preacher just trying to make me feel bad for being unfaithful. No, you're being a selfish brat. Right. You don't come to church just for yourself. You come because you're supposed to be encouraging one another. Doesn't the Bible tell you in the last days that you're supposed to be exhorting one another even more so as you see the day approaching? Where's your encouragement? Well, preacher, I'm just sort of not so quiet. You encourage me and other people by being here. Amen. You don't try to put me in bondage. I don't, no, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. No, you don't have to go to church to be saved. Amen. That's right. Right. That's right. Amen. But you've got to be a Christian to be a disciple. Amen. I heard a fellow say the other day, he got up and he was preaching, waxing eloquently about you know, taking care of things and making sure you take care of them people that God's given you. And, you know, if your wife's lagging behind, make sure you back up and don't go so fast that she can't keep up. And, you know, make sure that she's this and make sure she's that and make sure she's so on and so forth. And I'm thinking in my mind, what about that passage that said, Whoso loveth mother or brother or sister or, 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 or uh, husband or wife can't be my disciple? Yeah, see, see that? I ain't saying nothing to that. Yeah, without thinking spiritually, you think, well, you got to keep everybody happy. Keep mama happy. Keep daddy happy. Keep everybody else happy. As long as they're happy, you're good to go. You better worry about keeping Jesus happy. Amen. Who ever thought about that? You know, well, I don't have to go. You know, you don't. You don't have to go. Why don't you go? I'll tell you why. You want to know? Straight up, you're a selfish brat. That's why. You're only thinking about yourself. Amen. I'm tired. I'm wore out. If they were getting ready to go shoot skeet tomorrow or getting ready to go to a ball game or you knew that you were going to get the chance to go, you know, shoot an eight point or something, they're going to put you in the right stand or they're going to give you a chance to catch a fish or you were going to go to the Millennial Mall in Orlando with a thousand dollar shopping spree. You'd be like, well, I'm not that tired. But going and listen to that old Bible again. See, it don't make sense to your flesh. But God's up there writing. My God is right and my God is right and my God is right all the time. The character comes when you have to learn to do things you don't want to do. Amen. That's walking in the flesh or walking in the spirit. Which one are you going to choose? Amen. Amen. 
person. Well, you're irritating me. That ain't your soul being irritated. I guarantee you, it's your flesh. But after all, that's what we're here to do is make sure your flesh is happy. No, I'm sorry. That's not what this church is all about. Amen. We're not here to cater to your flesh. Amen. We're here to feed you the book. 1 John chapter number 4, verse number 9. This thing's real, folks. You're going to die one day and meet him. Amen. Then what you going to do? Lord, I don't feel like going today. <laughs> I can see this. I wish I could paint. I want to see this one day. The Lord goes, doo, doo, Come up in there. Uh, Lord, I, today's just really not a good day. Um, well, I see. I was trying to schedule the rapture out here, and I was just thinking, after my kids grow up and my grandkids grow up, after I get my house paid for and I get my 401K, my retirement, and get all that laid out, I, I need a little more money to first, Lord, and get that done. And um, could we postpone that, say, till 2030? Would that work for you? Would that be okay? Well, some of you live like that's all that matters is what you're doing. What if the Lord came right now? What would you have to turn loose on? <laughs> Say my kids. Yeah, I know. Some of you act like your kids are more important than the Lord. Your kids get between you and God. You think you're going to have plenty of time later when they grow up. You know what's going to happen to you? Your relationship with the Lord is going to grow so cold that when you get ready to come back, you ain't going to be able to come back. I know that's not very popular. See, my kids would never get between me and the Lord. Really? You sure about that? 1 John 4. Uh, and this was manifested, the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only Son into the world that we might live through Him. See, what's the big deal? His only Son? No, it says only begotten Son. Doesn't John chapter number 3 say, For God so loved the world that He gave His only what? Begotten How come they take begotten out? You're a son of God. But you're a son of God through Jesus Christ. There's only one begotten son. That's Jesus Christ. Why do they take begotten out? That's taken out of John chapter number 3 in 16 and then also in 3.18 there. And then here again in 1 John, he takes the word begotten out. Well, why would you take that out? What benefit is that? Unless somebody's trying to say, well, he was just a person. He was just a man. He was just a good guy. He was just a good prophet. I mean, he was, you know, just like Elijah and just like Jeremiah and, and those kind of guys. But he wasn't God manifest in the flesh. That's why they crucified him. He said, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Blasphemy, blasphemy, blasphemy. Kill him, kill him, kill him. Uh, come on a little bit further. Come, to, come back to uh, Matthew chapter 11. I, I like this one, Matthew chapter 11. I already showed you in Mark where they took hell out, right? Amen. Why would you take hell out? You see, what do they do? A lot of times they take it out like they do in Mark, but in some verses they change the word. Here's a sophisticated word for you. They change it to hotties. Another place they change it for a, a grave for souls, they change it to Sheol. Now, probably none of you know what Hades or Sheol is, but I bet you know what hell is. So what are they trying to do? Don't worry about hell. You know what a good motivator is for getting people saved? Hell. Look in Matthew chapter number 11. That's how come I got saved. I got saved because I didn't want to go to hell. I've told you probably a, a, a number of times, but I, I told you about the preacher that told me. He said, when would you get saved? I said, seven years old. He said, what would you do? And I said, I told my daddy I didn't want to go to hell, and I asked Jesus to save me. And, and uh, you know, he said, well, you couldn't be saved. And I said, what do you mean I couldn't be saved? He said, well, you didn't know about the virgin birth. And I said, okay. He said, you didn't know about the deity of Christ. I said, okay. And he goes, well, you can't be saved unless you know that. I said, listen, buddy, I knew Jesus Christ died for my sins according to the Scripture, was buried and raised again the third day, and I was a sinner and I was going to go to hell. I knew enough at seven years of age that all I needed was the elements of getting saved. Nowhere in the gospel do you have to know the virgin birth and deity of Christ. I knew God's Son died for me and saved me from going to hell, and I didn't have to go if I didn't want to. All I had to do was take a gift. Amen. 
Pastor, I just don't believe you're saved. And I said, okay, you doubt it. I'm not going to worry about it. Amen. Let him worry about it. I guess he'll be glad if he gets up there. I get up there to heaven and the Lord says, get out. And he'll say, see, I told you you weren't saved. I trust what the Bible says. Amen. I don't trust how much you know. I trust who I know. Amen. Uh, let me hurry. I'm, I'm really working hard at this. Look, if you will, please, in verse uh, Matthew 11. Look at verse 23. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shalt be brought down to... Hell. Uh, you know what they do? A lot of times they even change that in your margin. Brought down to hell... For if mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. You know what he said? Capernaum, I've done miracles. And if those miracles were done over there in Sodom, Sodom would have repented and gotten right. You've seen the miracles and you wouldn't repent. So you know what's going to happen to you? You're going to go to hell for it. Now why would they take hell out? Well, preachers, what they mean there is is that you're going to die. We're all going to die. They're talking about the eternal destination. They're not talking about a grave for the body. They're talking about where you're going to spend eternity. Right. Can I just say that's the crux of everything? Right. Where you're going to spend eternity? For us as Christians, what rewards are you going to get when you get there? Well, I'll just be glad to get there, you know, and I'll get me a mansion over by the creek somewhere, and I'll just be happy to have that. What makes you think you're going to be by the creek? <laughs> Who taught you that? <laughs> I'll just be happy if I can sweep the streets of gold. There's no dust. You don't have trash in heaven. You have recycled trash, me and you. <laughs> that's funny. It's recycled trash, but that's it. You say, what happens? Every time you put the, re the recycle bin, don't get me started. Every time you put the recycle bin out there, think about this. That's what happened to you. Yep. You were headed for the trash bin, but the Lord said, well, maybe I can do something with him. Let's recycle him. Amen. 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 You get up there, you know what happens? You know, what makes you think that? The Bible says, I go to prepare a place for the... What not you to, there are many mansions for you, right? That's right? What makes you think all you're going to be is hanging around in a mansion? You know, I think independent Bible believers, Baptist Bible believers, I think what they believe is you're going to be comparing mansions against mansions. Yeah. Come see my mansion. Have dinner with my mansion. Look at the size of my mansion. <laughs> I guess you must think that. The Lord goes to repair a mansion, not a room. That's changing all your other Bibles. Many mansions. You say, well, how can the Lord do that? He's God. You don't have to worry about building materials. He speaks them, they get in existence. Uh, all right, let me give you just a couple more here. Come to Luke chapter number two. Luke chapter two. I hope this is helping you. And yeah, I'm, I guess I'm being a little tongue-in-cheek here and, and making fun of them, but they make fun of you. You know what they think? They, they think there's something wrong with you. They think you believe the Bible. I had a guy tell me not long ago, he said, uh, do you have any education at all? I said, I don't know, maybe a little bit. And he said, and after all that, you still believe that the King James Bible is the only Bible? And I said, yeah, even more so. I said, one thing I learned from the education I have is that all people that are educated aren't as smart as they think they are. Amen. I said, they didn't manage to educate me out of it. Amen. Think about it for a second. Don't let anybody talk you out of that book. Amen. There's some old grandmas up in Carolina and across Tennessee and stuff like that. They got all through their Bible where they believe what God said in the Bible. You say, why? Because he said it. That's all, just because he said it. Well, he said it, I believe it. Uh -uh, you're adding an element not necessary. He said it, that's it. Whether you believe it or not, it's inconsequential. You believe in it doesn't put the coupe de gras on it, doesn't put the icing on the cake or the bow on the package and say, oh, well, because you believe it, that makes it so. No, it's so whether you believe it or not. I'd rather get up there to the judgment seat of Christ and have the Lord say, Peacock, come here a minute. Yes, sir, Lord, and come down there and hit that frozen firmament up there and lay out there across that sea of glass and uh, that his radiance is being reflected upward like that. I'd rather be laying right there in front of him and say, Peacock, I need to talk to you a minute. Yes, sir, Lord, what is it? And you, that King James thing, you just took a little too far, son. You just got all carried away. You know, you didn't realize that a better rendering would be, and if you'd spend a little more time studying Hebrew and Greek, and I'd rather him get all over me for, for believing one book. I believe if God can preserve my soul, he can preserve one book. Amen. 
If he can't, what kind of God is he? You think God, when we know man's the problem, let's just think for a minute logically, if we know man's the problem, you think God is going to turn you over to man's intellect? That's like feeding you to tigers. <laughs> Y'all be okay. Don't worry about it. Get out there, you know. I saw this lady the other day, and I told my wife they had a thing on TV, and her car caught on fire, and they were in a lion-tiger enclosure in South Africa, and it was either burn or get eaten. <laughs> I thought, man, she had kids in the car and everything like that, and I thought, man, I bet they didn't figure that one out. And she managed to grab the kids and get out of there before the lions got her, but I thought to myself, man, what a choice. You know, you get ready to get out, and it's getting hot, and you're starting to sizzle a little bit, and all of a sudden, <laughs> it's like, which, which will be quicker? <laughs> Luke chapter 2, <laughs> verse 22. This is a passage I told you about before. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. They changed it to their purification. It's her purification. Yeah. Two reasons they change it. Number one, to make Jesus a sinner. And number two, to make Mary not be included in the her there because she's perfect anyway. She's sinless. If Mary is sinless, how come she offers on the days of her purification? Number one, Catholic Church teaches that, that Mary's perfect. Number two, how come she offers the doves over there? Because she's a sinner. Say not the blessed birth. Yes. Another one, Luke chapter 4. I have a lot of stuff going on in my head. Luke chapter 4. I remember I told you on uh, Sunday morning, remember the passage I gave you in Psalms 133, we're talking about the, the, uh, the oil coming down there on Aaron running down his head and across his beard and then on the linen garment and that the oil at the bottom was the same as at the oil at the top. Amen. There's no break in that thing. There's nothing that dirties it up. It's the same at the top as it is at the bottom. Remember how I showed you the death in the pot over there in, in uh, Second Kings with Elisha and they put a bunch of wild gourds and stuff in there and they said it would be fine Then they ate it and said, man, this stuff will kill you. Right. And he had to put the meal in there, which is the right stuff, to get the corrupt stuff out of there to make sure it didn't kill them. Those are tight pictures of what they're trying to do with the Bible. They're just trying to put some gourds in there. They go, oh, it doesn't make any difference. It'll kill you spiritually, dead as a hammer. And you say, well, what's the difference, preacher? When it came from God in its original form, it's poured out right here, and it's the same thing as he intended for you to get. There is no original. That's a lie somebody told you. They don't exist. Where's the original of the Ten Commandments? He busted them. Well, if they're the originals, if they're the, you're going to tell me that when the Lord wrote it the second time, he didn't make it up the, the, the same way? Well, it's a Xerox copy. It's perfect. Probably ought not use an X there, but at any rate, it's a carbon copy of what was written before. You think when Jehudi comes over there with his pen knife with Jeremiah and cuts up the scrolls and throws them in the fire, you think that when the Lord gives it back to Jeremiah to give to his scribe again and it didn't come out exactly like it was the first time? Where's the originals? You don't have them. They're not the Dead Sea Scrolls. You say, what? Well, the Lord doesn't have them anymore. The so-called originals burned up in a fire not long ago. They don't exist. Why? You, you got better than the original. The translation's always better than the original. Enoch better the first time or when he was translated? Something to think about. Elijah better the first time or when he was translated? What about your Bible? You say, well, that's just men translating. I'm already showing you and it's common thread through all the versions. There was a lady out not long ago, well, it's been quite a while now, uh, uh, Ripplinger is her name, and she wrote several books. And a couple of guys that were on the New King James Committee, they sat down and read those books, and they realized after they read them that there were some things they didn't know. And a couple of them said, we were wrong in participating in this, and they do meetings about manuscripts and all that. And they pass out her books and say, we want to let you all know the King James Bible is the Word of God, and when we wrote that Amen. thing, we didn't know what we Amen. know now, and they repented of it. Wow. But some of them are too stubborn. 
I think God will bless that. Amen. So I was ignorant. I didn't know. I had all these letters behind my name, and I was taught this. But after I read all this stuff, collated and gone back over, I found out this girl's right about this stuff, and God was right when he gave you the King James Amen. Bible. Amen. Here's my book over here. It's free. I mean, here's her book over here. I give it to you for free if you want one. Now, that's her testimony. That's their testimony. They come to them, and they get hit with the truth, and they're like, well, we sure didn't know that. Do some study. Find out if I'm telling you the truth. Spend some time. Google it. <laughs> well, you know, I heard King James was a queer. Every time somebody goes to a personal attack, yeah, that's right. That's right. they got nothing. That's right. King James is the one where the word of the king is, there's power. That's right. King James is the one who told them boys and gave them the authority to give that. It comes from England. That's where your Greenwich time comes from. And it comes from there. So well, some, tell me some things about King James. What does that have to do with anything? He didn't write it. Right. He authorized it to be written. <coughs> Find me one other version that says authorized version. How come the Bible says where the word of the king Amen. is, there's power, and he authorized it? No other Bible you got says authorized version. The King James Bible, without any notes, without any marginal notes or anything, are you listening? I'm almost done. It's the only one that you, it's not copyrighted. Well, doesn't that sound like something the Holy Spirit would do? He wants everybody to have it. Amen. Every other one's got a copyright. So, well, my King James Bible has a copyright. Not on the text, it doesn't. Amen. Amen. You don't have to go get a permission to copy the text at all unless you copy their footnotes. Right. Right. Just the raw text in and of itself, there's no copyright on it. I used to have one back in my office. I looked for it the other day. It was a red Bible that I'd gotten. It had nothing but the text in it, nothing else, nothing but that. And I looked all through that thing because usually on the front it'll say copyright Lockman Foundation or it'll say this or it'll say that, copyrighted so-and-so, copyrighted so-and-so. There's not a copyright in it because it's just text. You say, why? Oh, the Word of God's not to be bound. Amen. Mm -hmm. That's good. Unless you're trying to corrupt it, mm -hmm. then you've got to make some money off of it. Right. You don't care how far you pollute it because you're interested in money. First Corinth, I mean, uh, Luke chapter 4. Let me give you this. We'll go to the barn. Luke chapter 4. Jesus uh, answered him saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone. You see that? They left something out. Yep. What? But by every word of God. They left out, but by every word of God. So there's a rule there that you're supposed to not live by bread, but you replace that bread with something else. Come down to verse 8. I'm going to close with this one. And Jesus answered and said unto him, It is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Wow. <coughs> you know what they took out? Get thee behind me, Satan. That's right. Who do you think authored that? Satan. <laughs> it's a little self serving, ain't it, devil? <laughs> I don't want my name in there. Take <laughs> Redact that. <laughs> Hand it to him with it blacked out, like some of these things you get, you know, and we'll give you the documents, and then they black the whole cotton picking thing out, and you can't make out what it says, you know. They, that's called redacting. It's a fancy word for blackout. Yeah. Who would, who would tell them to do that? Now think about this for a minute. If you're sitting down and you're rewriting or making a translation and all of a sudden you come up to that passage right there and it says that and it says, Get thee behind me, Satan, for man shall not live. And so if you think about that for a minute now, as, an, as, a, as a writer, wouldn't you think, Now wait a minute. Now, now who would be asking me to take that Get thee behind me, Satan, out? I think I'd be like, uh oh. I'll be looking around going, well, who inspired that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Couldn't have been the Holy Spirit. No. But they take it out. And Jesus answered and said unto him, It is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Oh, who's the him? Oh, it's just a person standing there. I don't know who it was. Just somebody, the Lord saw a ghost while he was out there in the yeah. wilderness. I don't know who it was. It was the devil. That's why over there uh, in your new versions they make, and I'll show you this on Sunday, Lord willing, you bring your notepad and stuff. But that's why they make the devil the, the morning star. 
because they're trying to replace the, the Lord and the devil and make the, the devil the good one and the Lord the bad one. So why? So that when he shows up in 2 Thessalonians, they'll say, there he is. There's the Lord. And they think you're going to, by that time, they'll think you've been worshiping the devil.